with you this morning at Anchor Church on a brisk, cold Sunday, March morning. The Lord is playing tricks on us. He gives us the sunshine and then he blows it away. But we are glad to be here worshiping the Lord. Our hope truly is found in Christ. You can put it in money. You can put it in your job. You can put it in a relationship, but it will fail you. Your hope is in Christ. Today, we're looking at a passage in Colossians that describes an incredible God the creator of the universe coming into creation to establish his rule and to allow us an opportunity to know him as savior, to develop a relationship with this very God that we can trust in the highs and lows of our lives. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Colossians chapter one, starting in verse 15 is where we're gonna be hanging out this morning. Not too long ago, I got to go to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. The grandparents were gracious and took us down there and we had a blast. There was fun in the sun and I got to try something new. We were riding on a boat across the bay to go have a nice beach day to do some whale watching. We got to see a mama and a baby whale nursing each other. It was the sweetest. It was so cool. And as we made our way across the bay, the driver, the captain of the boat, Adon said, hey, would you like to go spear fishing?" said, yeah, I'd love to go spearfishing. That sounds fun. I'm, I'm into that. I, I'd be down. Let's do this. And so we arrive on the beach, and he gives me all the weaponry. We've got a spear and a hook and a net, and we put on our flip furs, you know, and he, he's walking out to the middle of the uh, ocean there with his flippers in his hands, and I'm thinking I should put them on my feet because it's going to be hard putting them in the water, and I, I should just learn to follow the lead of someone who's done this before. Uh, I was flapping through the water, kind of murky and making my way, and I had all that drag, and finally I catch up to him, and I realized that that moment right there was going to be my only break. With my goggles on, I was ready to dive in, and this gentleman, who was probably about 48 years old and had about 58 more pounds on his body than me, outworked me in the ocean. For an hour and a half straight, we didn't touch the bottom. We kept diving in and out, up and down, looking for different sea creatures like starfish and octopus. And we were looking for lobster that day. And if we could find a yellowfish, he was able to bring some of these goods home where he could provide for his family and eat or sell it in the marketplace and maybe make about $50. And I had a hard time keeping up with him. I stayed at the surface. My flippers were going nonstop. And I'd have to bring those flippers up in the air and dive straight down into the water and look as fast as I could and go as far as I could. But I could not go that far. He outpaced me by about 20 feet. And we'd come up to the top and he'd say, did you see it? I'd say, I have no idea. No, I didn't see it. And he'd go back down. It's over here. And there were stingrays out there. And there was starfish and all kinds of great fish. And I never got a chance to reach out and grab one. I never got a chance to get close and shoot one. I never got a chance to be near one because I stayed up at the surface. I just didn't go further. And at the end of the day, I realized the fun is when you go deeper. That's where it's at. You've got to go deeper. If you want to see clearer, you've got to go deeper. If you want to have the fruit of your labor, you've got to go a little bit deeper. If you stay at the surface, the water looks a lot murkier there, and you're going to have a harder time being able to identify what from what. You've got to go deeper. You know, in life, sometimes God puts us in trials and allows us to go through difficult circumstances. And I believe it's so that we can go deeper. It's a lot harder to get further down. It's difficult to go further down. But God will allow you these seasons, these moments, and these opportunities to go deeper so that you can experience a greater joy, so that you can have a new reward that you wouldn't have had otherwise. God wants to teach us a lesson. He wants to show us something, and he wants to develop a dependence upon him and only him. Church, God called us last week to really go deeper. He called us to build our lives on the word of God, to frame our worldview through his lens and not our own, to see everything in life the way God would. And 
today we're going to look at the Christ, the one who can take us deeper, who will join us and will hold us and sustain us in some of our biggest trials. Verse 15 in Colossians 1 describes the preeminent Christ. It says that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Paul starts off this new section in thought in his letter to the church at Colossae, the church that was struggling, being overlooked, the church that had that new road built around them, bypassing them, this church that were going through their own growing pains, this church that was struggling with adding to the gospel and in taking away from its power, the church that was trying to get back on track theologically. And Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Growing up, I loved DC Talk, and when they would sing the lyric, I have never seen the wind, I've seen the effects of wind. I think about this passage. The image of the invisible God. Describing God to my kids is always a challenge. It's a lot of fun. Lily was wrestling with this idea that God is bigger, 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 bigger than anyone else. I said, well, he's not quite bigger than anyone else. He's talking about his power, but we can see who God is through Jesus. If you want to know who God is, look to Jesus. And it says that he's the image of the invisible God. If you're here this morning and you've been searching for who God is, and you want to know him more, and you want to know more about him, you just need to look to Jesus. You need to look to Jesus to find out who God is, because God's revealed himself as Christ the Son. The word image here, it's different than the idea of the Imago Dei where we reflect the glory of God that we all have been given intrinsic value, that each of us matter, that if you are a formed creation by God, that you've got value placed upon you as a human. The image of God is an image bearer, a reflector. But this word image here in the Greek New Testament gives this picture of a sovereign God revealing himself. In the old days, they would take coins and the sovereign of the nation of that day would be imprinted onto a coin. And it would look the exact same for every coin that was imprinted upon. Well, this has that idea of a sovereign imprint, but it takes it a little bit further. It takes it further saying that this is the complete manifestation of God. This is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God. If you've ever struggled with who is God or what he looks like, look to Jesus, Hebrews 1, 3 tells us he's that image. In John 14, verse 9, we can find more about that image. He's the picture of God, the person of Christ, representing the Holy Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say that he's the firstborn of all creation. Some commentators We'll discuss this, and they'll state that he was the first one to rise from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And others will say that he is basically first place in everything. I like to think of this passage as a picture of Christ who is placed as preeminent, as number one, at the top. In all of creation, he is above it. He takes first place. In the swim meet, he's got that first place ribbon waiting for him. Every area and category of life that we can think of, he takes that role as number one. That's a great example for us. Do we make Christ number one in our lives? If he rules and reigns and he's in the place of number one, over all of creation, do we allow him to live that way in our lives? Where we put him first, where we place him number one, where we seek after him. Verse 16 of Colossians chapter 1 
goes on to say, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. What a great picture of this man, Jesus. That everything that we know on this earth, in the heavens, whether it's visible or invisible, whether a ruler, a leader or not, that it was created by Jesus. I can reframe our picture of God because sometimes we think about God the creator and we attribute that to God the Father, but the Son, the person of the Son, Jesus, he is attributed with this role of creation. He created everything. He rules over everything. He's number one over everything. Can't we trust him with our lives, with our struggles, with our difficulties, with our hopes, with our dreams, with our relationships? Christ being a created. He was, he was not created. He's always been. He's always been been and always will be. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's separate from creation, distinct and different, and has the creativity to fashion this world. Sometimes we think about God as just very structured and in a box, but just think of the grand beauty and diversity in our world. That's Jesus, artistic, creative, I was listening to a TED Talk a few weeks ago, and they actually say that procrastinators are the most creative and original people out there. It's true. They did a massive study and a cross-section on employees, and they asked everyone who was a procrastinator, when they're given an assignment, do you consider yourself a planner or a procrastinator? Do you work ahead, or are you finishing at the last minute? See, some people, they have the same anxiety procrastinators have the day before you turn in an assignment. They just have that two months before, right? They get it all done, and they can be free the rest of the time. But they ask their employers, the bosses, the managers, who's the most creative? Who's the most original? Who has the most unique ideas coming to the table? And they overlapped, and they found that the ones who the boss thought was the most creative and most original was that procrastinator. Because if you give them an assignment and let them think and have space and play and distract themselves for a while, in the back of their heads, it's churning, it's developing, and then this new creative idea comes forward. I'm not saying Jesus was a procrastinator, but Jesus was pretty original, wasn't he? pretty creative he put everything into motion but why did he do that he did it as according to verse 16 for his own glory that through him and for him all things were created all things under heaven and earth the stars and the sky above it's all directed To bring praise to God. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And God presents an opportunity for all of us right here, right now. Before that day comes that we can join in the praises of the heavenlies. Verse 17 says that he is before all things. And in him all things are held together. He is before all things. The creator of all things. He's the glue that holds it all together. As the earth spins on its axis in perfect harmony, with distance from the sun, so perfectly designed that we would never burn up or freeze, but that we could have life. Jesus, he did that for his own glory. He holds that all together. I don't know if you came in today with a trial, if you've got an obstacle in your life, if you've got a suffering that's in front of you today, if there's a sickness or an illness or a loss of a family member that's got you paralyzed. I don't know what you are going through this very morning, but I want you to know that God holds it all together. Some of us 
as the psalmist would say, are in the very valley of the shadow of death. And we feel that that is imminent and it's present. We feel the weight of it. In Psalms 23, the psalmist writes such beautiful words in verse 1 through 4. If you have your Bibles, you can flip over there. You can follow along on the screens. You can join us on the YouVersion app and take notes with Anchor Church. You can also pick up one of our free Bibles in the back over by your left on your way out. But in Psalms 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And he leads me besides still waters. He restores my soul. And he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David writes these words, and it brings great memories to many of us as we've heard this psalm. It brings refreshment and revives our soul to know that in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, he's there with us. That he's there to comfort us. When Colossians says that he holds all things together, we've got to realize that God holds even our struggles that we're going through. He allows those and he holds us together in the midst of them. My friend Eric Johnson visited the Middle East. He went to the Holy Lands and he actually went through this valley, the valley of the shadow of death. It was before a time where he was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and he knew that he would die. And he describes the landscape of this valley being very narrow. About 800 feet of an ascent. And that the only time the sun would shine was at the noonday. The noonday sun shining. And a lot of times life is spent in the shadows. It's, it feels as if it's spent navigating through a tight, narrow area. We're going through a hard time and we're wondering, where is the sun? That valley was known as a place where robbers would lurk around any corner, ready to take someone's belongings and possibly even their life. It was a shortcut. It was a quicker route. So if you took that route, it was a little bit of a gamble. But going through there, you were waiting for that noonday sun to illuminate your path and bring you warmth. And all of us are waiting for the sun. We're waiting for Christ to shine on us in the midst of our valley. The valleys in Scripture are all over. There's great principles. And pictures of Trusting God in the midst of the valley. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 28, King Ahab is trying to be deposed by the Syrians. They want to take him. Earlier on, the Israelites had defeated them. And they were discussing why did they lose this battle? And they thought, well, it's because the battle was. In the hills, they want to catch him in the valley. Look with me in verse 28 of 1 Kings. It says, A man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. The Syrians thought, we'll catch him in the valley. Get him down in the valley, and that's where we'll take them out. We'll be victorious. And as the Israelites stood against a mighty army in the Syrians, outnumbered by the thousands, God says, I got a plan. I've got a greater plan. They think that just mountaintop experiences is where I show my glory. When things are going great, when it's smooth sailing, when I can see for miles, when I can experience the climb and the ascent and the victory that's within that. But it's in the valleys 
It's in the valleys and the shadows that the enemy wants to get us. It's in the valleys and the shadows that we're oftentimes at our weakest. When we're sick, when we're tired, when we're hurt, when we're struggling. But in our weakness, he can be made strong to declare that he is the God of the hills and the valleys. That he'll give them that victory, and he did so. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11, look with me here. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven. See, this is a picture that I want us to see this morning. Life is full of hills and valleys. It's full of low points and high points. I put on your chair an armband. Jude is our new marketing agent. He's our marketing consultant. Jude is Chad's son. Jude was assigned by Jordan to go display these in the children's ministry. And he put them all arranged perfectly. And they looked beautiful. It was an ornamental display. Jude's the man. We're going to seek him for all marketing issues from this point forward. And br he brings these bracelets over to Jordan. Jordan says, what, what is that? And he goes, I don't know. It's something in Greek. <laughs> that's a pastor's kid right there. <laughs> it's like, that's a Greek. No, that's not Greek, okay? It says, gee, God is greater than our ups and our downs. You take this bracelet. You wear it. You wear it just for service, okay? If you're not a bracelet wearing person, okay? Put it on a keychain or a necklace or put put it in your car put it somewhere take it home and remind yourself of the God who revealed himself the invisible God who displayed himself to be visible through Christ the one that holds all things together can you trust God with the creation of this world yes can you trust God through your trials and struggles? Yes. But have you trusted God for salvation? Verse 18 says that he is the head of the body, the church. I'm a pastor. Chad's a pastor. Jordan's a minister. Yes, but we report to Jesus. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the head of the universal church, of all churches, and he is the head of this church. He's in charge. It's our job to listen and follow where he leads. And it goes on to say he's the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. In everything he might be number one. For in him all the fullness of God was well pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things on earth. Whether in heaven making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present to you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from this hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. In Romans 5, 1 and 10, we see God make us a part of his family to be friends with God once again. That we're hostile mind, we're an enemy of God when we don't know Jesus. We're pitted against him whether we realize it or not. And through Christ, he brings harmony. He restores the relationship. He reconciles it. The account, the reconciliation, is he makes the accounts balance again. He puts them back into order. I'm so thankful to Jesus. Because some of us, when we sin, when we're 
dabbling in our old self and its nature that we no longer have. We've got a new self. We've got a new heart. We've been given a new nature. It's the nature of Christ. And with this body of flesh, it's wasting away. It struggles. It's, it, it, it faces difficulties and temptations. And, and when we hit those moments, those are low points, we, we realize, gosh, that's not holiness. That's sin. And, and, and it shows us once again that God is holy. He is righteous. He is separate than us, but we can tend to feel this guilt and this weight. I talked to a friend recently. That friend has three different religious beliefs, not Christian. And through his life, he's flagellated himself, he's beaten himself, he's cut himself, he's burned himself for punishment over his sin. He wouldn't call it that, he would call it not being perfect. His aim and his goal is to excel and exceed in everything he does. But I look at this passage of scripture and my heart doesn't turn to guilt, my heart turns to joy. I'm new in Christ. The God who holds all things together, the one who created all this for his own glory, that which I've messed up, he's made right. Look again with me in verse 21. You're alienated and hostile in mind. You're doing evil deeds. Just fill in your own blank of your own sin struggle. We all got them. But he has now, in verse 22, reconciled in his body of flesh. How did God make that possible? What did he do? He reconciled us in his own body of flesh. He took upon our sins and its consequences that lead to death, as Romans says. He did that willingly on our behalf. And by his death, in order to present us, his church, holy and blameless and above reproach. What a joy. What a replacement. The great exchange takes place when we accept Christ into our lives, when we surrender our life to him. We don't have to pay for our own sin. We're going to hit natural consequences for things that we do here on earth. That's, that's a given. But eternally, we don't have to pay for our own sin. We don't have to hold that weight over us and that guilt. It's been set free. Mark made a joke this morning as I walked into church carrying all my bags. He said, I see you come to church with a lot of baggage. You get to just drop that baggage. Why don't you drop that baggage? Why don't you be led by grace and not guilt? Jesus and his work on the cross was done that we might, according to verse 23, continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel of which you've heard. We call Anchor Church anchor because of Hebrews 6 19 that in Christ we have this hope for salvation he is our hope we want to see people anchor their lives to Christ we want to see people's lives transformed by Jesus for the glory of Jesus we want to see people reconciled back to God we can trust God for creation We can trust God in the midst of the hills and the valleys, the highs and the lows. We can trust God for salvation. Have you made him Lord? Have you accepted his free gift of grace? You cannot pay that payment on your own. You need him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. And our hearts want to cry out to you and sing to you and say thank you for so many of us. We needed a reminder today that you're in control. The diagnosis we just received, you hold all things together. 
the jobless market that we're trying to come out of. We know that you hold all things together. The struggles in parenting that we're having in our relationship, we know that you hold all things together. We can trust you, Lord. The one who created this world. May we trust you for salvation. If there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you'd awaken their heart right now. And that they'd respond in faith to you and they'd live a life that walks boldly with you. That they'd say, I'm, I'm going to go deeper today. Just attending church, it's just very surfacey. I need to commit my life to you. I need to surrender my life to you this morning. Others that are facing the valley of the shadow of death, the struggle, that they would just come surrender to you, that they'd surrender that plan and say, God, I trust your plan and I'm going to surrender to it. Carry me through it. In Jesus' name, amen.